car and the price of a few gallons of petrol. Which he can always mortgage his house for. Hmm? Ah, oh, yes. Uh, what's at the end of this section here? Uh, worth seeing, huh? It was a small lake. Well, more a large pond, really. And we've been draining it out now for two days. Then it was at the other side of the lake. Well, apparently they found something unusual in the lake. We shouldn't be able to see it, just past there. Oh. Not a curse about the look of it. No. That's a Pembroke. Is there still any room? Unless they bailed out. There, in the cockpit. At least one of the poor bastards. It's kind for several years. Whilst draining a small lake to make way for the new M62 extension in Lincolnshire, the wreckage of a plane has been discovered. The aircraft's serial number reveals it to be a Pembroke of Transport Command, which the RAF announced was reported missing in December 1956. Only one body has been recovered, and that is believed to be the pilot, whose name is being withheld pending further formalities by the Ministry of Defence. OK, Lefty, this is it. It's curtains for you. Don't speak too soon, Blue Eyes. I got four cats aimed at your bread basket. Two on the gas station roof, three to back of Mark Kelly's. Oh, wait a minute, Lefty. Maybe we can make a deal, you know? Hello? David, have you been watching television? Incredible, isn't it? I thought you'd raise an eyebrow. I mean, if gangsters can't get their sums right, well, two on the gas station roof, plus three back of Mark Ellis, that's five, not four. What the hell are you talking about? Television. The gangster film. David, I meant the news. Uh, something about a plane. Don't speak on the telephone. Come to the office. OK, I'll see you first thing in the morning. Now, David, be there in an hour. It's really pleasant driving outside the rush hour. I understand better go to Sir Alex's office. What's all the ruddy fuss? Oh, it's this Pembroke they found. Apparently a case the old man was working on before he reached the top table, back in 56. And with Middle East connections, why is that? Well, why else would they rope me in? Llewellyn's here. Driver was down in the carpool. Llewellyn's biggest task is finding out just what the minister wants to hear, so he can doctor his advice accordingly. Who 
else is here? Just us three. Interesting. And then we're not attachment. The technical stuff, I suppose. You, Nick Security. And me, Middle East Pundit. The reason why I phoned you, David, was not actually to do with the Middle East. This battle flag is very pretty. You've got nothing like it at the Foreign Office. Where did you get it? Some grateful Patans presented it. If it's not to do with the Middle East, would somebody mind telling me precisely why I've been dragged out of my house in the middle of the night? Come, come, David. It's only ten past twelve. Right. Coffee, everyone? Hugh, could you pass these around? Certainly. David, now, can you give us a brief resume of the story contained in these files? Four photographs, four men. In 1956, three bailed out of the crash Pembroke and lived. Tierney, the navigator, Morrison, the engineer. Men with quite remarkable memory for detail. And Jones, the passenger with a more average memory. And of course, the poor chap whose body was found today. The Soviets showed remarkable interest in the crash at the time. Three people were murdered in the next few months. Two petty crooks and an officer. All appear to be linked in some way to this case. Three killings in Amsterdam, Berlin, and Norwich. Where a jeweler was tortured and killed by an ex-POW who turned out to be working for the KGB. The police passed the case on to intelligence and the British counter-investigation was led by me. Eventually, and Peter Diot. Remains one of the thousand mysteries in our archives. Questions so far? Uh, with all due respect, Alec, what has such ancient history got to do with present government policy? And what on earth does it have to do with me? The KGB was after the crash plane, something it was carrying. That much is surely clear. Routine flag like RAF gutter shown to Berlin, on from Berlin to the UK. That was a routine stop. Until 2200 hours, when he radioed from over the Belgian coast that he developed engine trouble. I'm not really interested in why the plane crashed. Could the key to this be that this uh, squadron leader Steerforth was involved in uh, smuggling, black market, out of Berlin, 45, 46? Well, that was a good 10 years before the crash. But there was nothing to indicate such interest in the official manifest. Who ran the Moscow then? A somewhat fresh-faced Igor Panin. Not the Igor Panin. Your alter ego your unseen sparring partner these last seven years. Which explains why I'm taking you out of the Middle East section and putting you onto this case as a field officer. But I'm no field officer, Alec. I came straight into analysis from a safe, gentle job at Oxford. <laughs> David, some of your recent work has been a virtual parroting of Israeli foreign policy. We think you need a break. A sabbatical. I'm being shunted out. Time to broaden your horizon. If you're going to be any further use to the firm. In the midst of life, we are in death. Of whom may we seek for succor, but of thee, O Lord, who for our sins are justly displeased. Yet, O Lord God most holy, O Lord most mighty, O holy and most merciful Saviour, we therefore commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Good afternoon, Mrs. Jones. My name's David Audley. I'm from the Ministry of Defence. You come to give your condolences, have you? Yes, that's right, Mr... It was good of you to come. Of course, it all happened so long ago. But Gilbert and I have been married for over 20 years. Those two young men there are our sons. And you must be Faith, John Steerforth's daughter. You knew him, did you? No. I, uh, I read up his war record. Quite a pilot. 
Arnhem, DSO, Special Operations, DFC, plus a, quite a go from the Belgians, and then the Berlin Airlift. Uh, fine men. They were all fine men. Oh, this business brings it all back. How different life was in those days. Quality of life. Lee's father died for something he believed in. Yes. Yes, I, I think you can be sure of that. You didn't fool me for a moment, Mr. Orderly. Is that your real name? My dear chap, I wasn't trying to fool anybody. MI5 or whatever. Don't you fellas ever let up? Isn't there a statute of limitations or something? Why don't I buy you a drink, Mr. Jones? You were the passenger on the last flight. And three years later, you married his widow. A fine man. <laughs> He may have been a good enough pilot, but he was also a damn selfish bastard. You didn't say that 27 years ago. We were in the same squadron. We didn't rat on your mates. At least not in our lot, you didn't. So why say it now? Well, I wasn't married to his widow 27 years ago. As come to think of it, I hadn't even met Margot then. When I fell in love with the lass. Well, I learnt about Johnny, I'm sad to say. Did you? Hmm. Margot's a decent enough woman. Steerforth got her pregnant, and then lost interest in her when she got big. Played around, you know? I know. You know? Oh, yes, of course, the bloody files. I'm surprised they hadn't been chucked out in the weeding process. <laughs> so was I, actually. Oh. So you haven't been dogging this thing personally since 1956? Hardly. I was at Oxford at the time. What are you, some sort of military intelligence? I think so. This is my first day in a new job. I'll tell you something else I didn't mention 27 years ago. What's that? I didn't believe he was dead. Neither did Tierney nor Morrison. Really? Why not? No, it was too damn convenient. As you know, he'd been up to his old tricks. Oh, come now, Mr. Audley, don't look so coy. You must know. Yes, I thought you went so dumb. On the last flight? Ah, yes, the last flight, they were onto something really big. I wasn't in the crew, so I wasn't in on it. But believe me, they were very excited. They were like schoolboys with a copy of Health and Efficiency. Phil! How did it go? No suspicious characters turned up, apart from Dr. Audley and myself. How did he get on? Last I saw, he was driving off with Jones. Good. Put in the door, at least. Now, Hugh, don't misunderstand me. This is business. And not all our business is good, clean fun. I have been here a year and a half, sir. We want you to keep a close eye on David, on uh, Dr. Audley. He's been moved sideways to a good job, and if I know him under that academic exterior, he'll be fuming. David always insisted that the Middle East desk couldn't run without him. And others would agree. But his intelligence analysis didn't suit the Arabists in FCO, particularly Llewellyn. Now, don't be bloody impertinent, laddie. I'll have you back with the crabs painting the runways at Bryce North. With all due respect, sir, I'll be very happy to get back to my proper profession. Mm, will you work for me at this precise moment? And this is your brief. Monitor David Audley, while formally attached to this case, as his two IC, and report back in writing twice weekly to me. Under protest. Christ almighty, Russ! What a bloody trade union meeting. And in reply to your next question, it's none of your business whether or not a copy of your report will go to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Actually, my next question was going to be, do we have a code name allocated to this inquiry? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Lucretia. Lucretia. Yes, I'm afraid so. Operation Lucretia. Good God. So then what did he say? What? Jones. Oh, he, uh... He recounted how these Russians had hung around pretending to be Hungarian refugees. Air Force. Uh, their story was that, um... 
they'd had a contract with Steerforth to smuggle some kit into the country, and uh, where was the trunk? Had there been a trunk? Jones didn't know. He never saw the cargo hold. However, he introduced them to a crowd of real Hungarian freedom fighters. And? I gather that the Magyars weren't 100% pro-Russian. And that was the end of it? Oh, here's how Jones described one of them. About five foot ten, brown hair, brushed straight back, piercing eyes, a very determined looking bastard. You go pan in. serial number reveals it to be a Pembroke of Transport Command, which the RAF announced was reported missing in December 1956. Only one body has been recovered, and that's believed to be the pilot. Welcome back, Mr. Steerforth. Your resurrection might not be a minute too soon. I'm sorry, look, I know this is a bit of an intrusion. I... Uh, no, not at all. Would you like a drink? Thank you. Right. Here's the temperance. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have come. Mm, I'm glad you did. You know, you really do resemble your father. You've got lovely taste for a policeman. Hmm. Why did you come? I'm not a policeman, by the way. Who told you that? Well, Dad. Gilbert. Hmm. I'm a boring old civil servant, I'm afraid. Actually, he didn't tell me. No, I didn't think you would. I overheard him and my mother. Quite happy, really. So it was unusual to hear them quarrelling. I shouldn't have listened. You shouldn't have listened. You shouldn't have come. Miss Steerforth, your life is full of regrets. You see, my real father, John Steerforth, he's always been sort of... Hero. Yes. I was actually almost bored by people like you saying how fine and brave he was. But secretly, I was very proud. I even bought a book all about the planes he flew. Dakotas, Lysanders, Pembrokes. He was a very courageous man. A fine pilot. Well, today I heard my stepfather saying he was a thief. A cheap little crook. Nicking stuff out of Berlin and hawking it on the black market. Now my parents are fighting with each other frightened in case these weird people start coming around again. What weird people? Apparently, when I was a kid, these foreigners used to make a bit of a nuisance of themselves. I heard Mum saying. Saying what? She said, it's all starting all over again. So Daddy wrote down your address and phone number and said she should get in touch with you if anything happened. That was sensible. And you, Mr. Civil Servant, do you reckon it's all starting up again? whatever it is. Yes. I see. Would you like to help? Of course. What can I do? Well, you set the table and I'll put on the stew. Very domesticated. For a, whatever you are. Ah, you're not the first person to say that. 
I suppose you think we all drape ourselves around the bar at Boodle's every night and bring home a cold fish supper after pink gins and billiards. What's Boodle's? Um, oh, forget it. Bad joke. Um, and truer than you'd imagine. I've got some Stilton. Um... Be lovely. <laughs> it's rather nice to have company. It's a bit cramped for space at the moment, Sam, but it'll be handier than being stuck in the annex of the other crap. Air Force chance. Fine. Could you get me the file on Tierney and Morris? Thanks, that. Anything else? Um, typewriter. Oh, I'll do any typing you need, Sam. Oh, super. Morning, all. Got a piece of luck. Managed to persuade daughter of J.S. to stay the night. I'll just get those files. How was that? Maybe she doesn't want to hear about your sex life. Sex? <laughs> Good God, no. I, uh, put the opportunity to far better use. You interest me strangely. Father, Steelforth. Stepfather, Jones. Mother, strange foreigners hanging around. And the present whereabouts of Tierney and Morrison. That's a relief. I thought I'd have to spend a boozy lunch with the thin blue line. No need to trouble the branch. Here. Do liaise with the local law, but I want a discreet dossier on both of those before we make direct contact. When will that be? Uh, tomorrow. Great. That leaves plenty of time to compile two curricula vitae. Well, uh, don't stand on ceremony, lad. Push off. Or is this the day you have to tap out your report on me? I, uh... Don't be embarrassed. It's part of the job. Oh, well, no doubt he's got you reporting on me. No, he hasn't. But if you get stuck for any details, just, uh, ask. And for your information, I'm now off to see the senior Mossad man in London. One Jacob Ram Shapiro. Yes, well, I won't mention that to the boss. Why not? I seem to recall hearing you being warned off your Israeli chums a few nights ago. Parroting Israeli foreign policy was the way it was delicately put. You tell him everything, young fellow. Otherwise, you wind up grey and wizened and haggard, like me. <laughs> Lovely morning. Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yes. We've come about the car. Car? Yes. Renault 16, 61,000 miles, color green. Yes. We would need to drive you for buying. Ah. Well, um, Mr. Audley isn't here. He's gone to London. He's not here. Afraid not? Thank you, anyway.
Hello, David. Are you looking or buying? Utopia. What price? Good question. How's tricks? So, so. Uh, something you could do for me. What's that? <laughs> it's my daughter's 14th birthday, a week Monday. Naturally. I, I just... Uh, look, I love her. It's just I don't know what the hell to give her. I hardly ever get to see them, you know. It's a problem. When Laura left me, we hadn't got round to kids. Maybe that was the problem. Brace. Christ, Jake, I don't know. The apartment of our Air Force attaché was burgled last Thursday. He had foolishly left some classified papers in his briefcase. So, copies are now circulating all over MOD, right? Are you asking me or telling me, Jake? Would you tell me if I asked you? Would you trust me if I told you? Son of a bitch. I guess I would. The results would certainly have been circulated to the Middle East desk. And you no longer work there. News travels far. So, you would guess? I would guess the British service had nothing to do with it. Yeah. So what can I do for you? It concerns Igor Panin, a crushed Pembroke. Panin? Berlin, 1956. There you have me. David, you're a couple of years older than me. All that Suez Cold War time is a closed book to me, I'm afraid. Apart from lectures at Staff College. Why don't you ask Theo? Theodor Friesler. Never heard of him. Oh, he's one of our great Nazi hunters. Some say, the thinking man Simon Wissenthal. Try this. He's an Amontillado with just a hint of drought-wrecked Spanish hillsides. Thanks. So, Panin. Berlin. What else? According to our files, we picked up a Russian agent following the murder of a Norwich jeweler who used to buy certain items from the pilot of the Pembroke, but that was years ago. Well, this pilot was in the jewel trade. Excellent cherry. Really nutty. Muchas gracias. <laughs> so, the Russian agent had connected the jeweler to a slow burning gas cooker, which he seemed to imagine would help further his inquiry. And what did this Russian want? He was too frightened of his masters to say. But he did mention some boxes. And, uh, some Nazi outfit in Berlin, uh, Forschungsamt, Fear BW9. You know what this was? Frankly, the Second World War and the Third Reich have never been my cup of tea. I think someone has leavened your present cup of tea with a strong dose of paraquat. Any chance of you being a touch less obscure? Don't you know? It is clear to me, my dear sir, that you have been assigned to an inquiry where your personal safety can no longer be taken for granted. I just hope you have not been followed here. And a briefing for the PM and the Australian High Commissioner on the same subject. 
capital. How's the Pembroke Inquiry coming on? Well, it's in David Audley's hands. And he's not really au fait with the routine for a field investigation. Is he completely on his own, or do you have someone senior keeping the watch in brief? First class question, dear boy. Tell me, is his absence from the Middle East desk arising much comment in uh, King Charles Street? Nothing more than a few sighs of relief. Still, I've been reading his analysis. Not perhaps towing the line, but well informed, I've always honest, I thought. Perhaps dear old David is a touch too honest, Alec. I mean, one would hate to use the term naive. Incidentally, the word is he's still hand in glove with the Red Sea pedestrians. Yes. How's Alexander these days? Oh, very chipper. She took a bit of a tumble at the coxcomb point to point last Saturday. Broke a damned elbow, poor dear. Yes. Norum, it's nothing personal between you and David Audley, is it? My dear Alec, whatever gave me that idea? isn't here just now. Steerforth. All right, Miss Steerforth, I'll tell him. Thank you. Bye. Grace, the squadron leader, has he left an envelope for the boss? No. Did Dr. Audley mention he was selling his car? No. Won't get much for it. It's hardly worth three foreigners trekking out to his farmhouse, is it? That old banger? I'll say not. Why? Pembroke! Oh, you're in dead luck, old boy. I've just got the latest jet fix range. Perfect. In every detail. I had something larger in mind, Mr. Morrison. Uh, larger? Oh, I'm sorry. Unless you compute up the scale drawings, double the size. A bit tricky, though. Life size. Life size? You're having me on on the sport. <laughs> Life size? This is a model shop. You are 0194536 Sergeant Morrison Thomas Anthony. Now, don't tell me I've won something in a 40 year old raffle. <laughs> What's the problem? The problem is yours, friend. And don't play dumb. The papers and TV have been full of the discovery of your old kite. G. George 111M Mike Squadron Transport Command. I'm Roskill. MOD Security. We've reopened the file and, quite frankly, sir, you're in trouble. The pack of lies you've been caught up in. Lies? I haven't... So let's have the truth now, shall we? It's a pity to go to prison for something that happened nearly 30 years ago, isn't it? Now look, I didn't mention the boxes at the formal inquiry. Because we all thought Johnny Steerforth had faked his death and, and scarpered with, a, you know, with a big one. And you hoped by keeping quiet, dear old Steerforth would turn up one day with a fistful of red eggs? Well, more or less. What was in the boxes? Only Johnny knew. And Bert, pilot officer Tierney. I was just a lookout. Jake, Shalom. Theo. How's tricks? He's asking about forcing some 4B. How much does he know? He gives the impression he knows nothing. It's not an impression to be relied upon. Did he give any hint what Panin is after? I will keep in touch. <laughs> so I told him not to leave town. Do you think he will? I doubt it. And was he the only lookout on the last flight? Who knows? We have to know, Hugh. We can't have these loose ends hanging around all over the shop. By the way, I phoned the office. Grace says that Faith Steerforth telephoned. I think it's time we paid another visit to Mr. Morrison, now that you've softened him up a bit.
no, sir. That was a felony. Yes, well... You can stop being so damn courteous and uh, call me David. Right, sir. As in not breathing, sir. No can SB has been very good. You and you don't exist as far as the police are concerned. And the first hint from the pathologist is broken neck, as Hugh rightly diagnosed. So it was an accident? What makes you think it might not have been? A man called Friesler. He thinks we're sailing into a somewhat murky area. Well, and it's never been one to shrink from getting nasty. So there was a chance that he was pushed. No, not as far as the local law are concerned. But Hugh's report does mention a female traffic warden outside Morrison's shop. Yeah. Well, I don't know who was paying her, but it wasn't the local council. Their traffic wardens were changing shifts at the time. Grace, get me Miss Steerforth on the line. I'm having a lovely time. I hope it's not too soon after the funeral. My father's been dead for years. It was upsetting for Mum, of course, but I never knew him. He more or less walked out on her. He died before I was born. Hmm. Coincidence, her marrying someone from the same squadron? Not really. Mum was a long way from home. The squadron was their closest family, in a way. Tell me about the chaps that wanted to buy my car. Just three blokes, really. Foreign. Hardly a word of English between them. What exactly do you do at the Ministry of Defence, David? What sort of ages? I don't know. Just three blokes, really. Middling. kitchen of yours, it's really evocative. It's like those ads on the telly for home-baked bread. Height, Faith. I really do need a better description of them. Tell me something. If I can. Did you ask me out tonight for business or personal reasons? Ah, oh, that's what's troubling you. Well, you can put your mind at rest. I certainly don't know you well enough to presume to ask you for a date. So it's professional? Of course. And the meal and the pleasant surroundings make it less... less formal, is that it? Something like that. It's, it's all paid for by HMG. Oh, stop it, Mr. Audley. Next time you want to interrogate me. I suggest you go and get a warrant or whatever. Uh, Faith, Miss Steerforth. Eat up. It's on expenses. Oh, capital. It's against SOPs for an illegal to visit the embassy. Come on, everybody in London knows I'm the Israeli spy. So 
I gave you a shopping list already. What have we got? For you, Jake, we have been slaving night and day. Meetings with the British, US embassy briefings, monitoring the PLO, they'll take a back seat for our chief undercover man. What was all that about your daughter's birthday? Cut the crap and deal. Right. You asked for an update on David Audley. A Soviet embassy spook called Guriev. Pyotr Alexandrovich he has been sniffing around Audley's house and generally keeping tabs. What's the radio traffic like? Soviet embassy to Moscow. Two separate increases. Unexplained from the Soviet embassy proper and from the Aeroflot manager's house in Highgate. So, this Pembroke must have been carrying quite a large cargo. It's a stupid question, but what was in its hold when they found it in the lake? Nothing. Apart from legitimate cargo, the cupboard was bare. So Steerforth must have gotten rid of whatever it was he was carrying. Between telling the crew and passengers to bail out... And, and crashing. And crashing into the lake. And who, apart from Igor Panin, knows what Steerforth nicked from Berlin? Who indeed? Not you by any chance. Scouts on her. Surprise. <laughs> I feel rather stupid. <laughs> Come inside. You must be hungry. All right, all right. No need to rub it in. What is it? Well, I take it this is a social call. Came to apologize. I suppose that's social. Good. It's just that. I've been so wrapped up in work, I hadn't really looked on you as a... Bit of crumpet. Don't get waspish again. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's I who should apologize. Oh, my God, a spark of gallantry. So I make a big pot of it on Sunday night, and it lasts me for the rest of the week. Don't you get bored with it? Not at all. Tuesday, I convert it to ragu by adding some wine. On Thursday, a judicious leavening of paprika changes it into goulash. And on Friday, the remains become David Audley's famous curry and rice. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> what about Saturday? Ah. Well, as a reborn bachelor of fading eligibility, one generally gets invited out on Saturdays. You were married once. Hmm. Eight years. How about you? Couple of steady boyfriends. Once got serious. Hmm. What happened after eight years? Or would you rather not say? Divorce. Civilized? Divorce is never civilized. She thought she hated my job and all the time it was me. You don't seem all that easy to hate. <laughs> she didn't believe it herself, so she blamed the poor old office. What exactly do you do? Quiet. I'm sorry if I'm asking the wrong questions. Shh. So, geese. Yes. Do you know why I got them? No. Eggs? David? Something wrong? A certain Roman general kept geese outside his camp. They, uh, their cackling warned his sleeping army if the enemy attempted a sneak attack. Just... Well, they don't cackle if anyone comes up the front path, Faith. They're used to that.
astonish you. A priest's hole. Not to put too fine a point on it. Oh, no, no, no. I'm afraid of confinement. <laughs> Is it quite safe to venture out now, Dr. Audley? What time do you have to be at work? I suppose you know exactly where I work. Of course. But I don't know what time you have to be at the school. About 11. Huh. Well, then. There's no immediate rush. Shouldn't we see if the supposed prowlers are still here? East. But you made it up. Well, right, just to get you in here. And then I'll break the glass. Hmm. That's nice. This is what they teach you at the Ministry of Defence. Surprisingly, it's something I got the hang of all by myself. <laughs> I really don't see why I can't have a bath. Because I don't want you blown to bits. Really, David? Look, we were broken into last night. You heard them, I heard them. The geese heard them. And this morning, there's not even a broken pane of glass. So nobody broke in? They did. Old Uncle David's traps work with the most careful prowlers. This house has been well turned over, dear girl, by experts. God, what a horrible feeling. Now. I found a passage to the front door without making any bangs. So follow me, and we'll phone the office from a local call box. Do you mean they booby-trapped the place? Well, either that or we're wired for sound. Of course we should speak. Mustn't let these people grind you down. Bunch of impotent non-entities, a lot of them. <laughs> Really ask something else. <laughs> Colin, got a job for you. Not me, boss. I was night duty technical officer. Jelly's late, or I'd have been off. Take. Take a team. I wanted. No, no, actually, two teams. I want a demolition sweep and a check for electronic surveillance at Dr. Audley's house. That's the address. Sir, I'm playing football this afternoon. I'm rostered off as of 20 minutes ago. Then you'd better take three cars in case you need to leave one for Dr. Audley. Also, take two close escorts from the muscle pool. And? What are you doing with that? Bugging it? No, sir. It's for, um, We salvaged it from that embassy fire. Well, get it licensed.
see the bird taking a bath in there. And? Well, she said, all clear, is it? And I said, well, the place isn't going to blow up as far as I can see. So when she goes, taps on, gear off, bubbles. I didn't know you used bubbles, sir. I also have a clockwork duck. <laughs> I take it we're clear for bangs. Yeah, as far as I can see. The debuggers aren't through yet. Aha! Gotcha. Wired for sound? Not exactly. Bleepers. So that they can follow your car, sir. I do know what a bleeper is, Jenkins. The first one, the Ovis McGuffin, is intended to be found, correct? Right. And this boat is intended not to be found. And the boat is also a bleeper. Yeah. And of course, there could be a third. Well, there could be. But this is a check device. They supply them for every known make of vehicle. Also packed funny people use them. Jenkins? Sir? Uh, locate and identify all the eavesdropping devices in and around the house. Ah, and just one thing. Sir? Do you remember that uh, lecture we gave to Special Branch? Last Country House weekend? Where you got all tired and emotional and proposed to Miss Marsh? Um, when Chief Superintendent Brady fell off the fire escape and broke his hip flask. That's the one. Ah, got it. Right you are, Chief. What was that all about? A lecture about turning uh, electronic surveillance to advantage. Don't know how you can get so enthusiastic about all these things. I want you to drive Faith to uh, Newton Chester. Book her into a hotel. Who's Faith? Here she comes. See, you're rather taken to field work. What's the name of this hotel? Paul. You don't say. Good morning, Miss Steerforth. You look somewhat different out of uniform, squadron leader. Or have you changed jobs since we last met? I... Uh, Hugh works with me. Faith, I have a request to make. Yes. Um, I'd like to take you out of circulation for a few days. Um, keep you out of trouble. I'm serious. So that's two rooms at the Bull Hotel. Is that right, sir? What? One will do. Won't it, David? Right then, I'll see you later, David. Oh, words all over town. The Israelis are tapping orderlies every move, sir. But our friends from the Moscow Ring Road worry me. They're clumping round like Inspector Clouseau. Slipshod, are they? Mm, they're professional enough, I suppose. Not quite the standard we've come to expect from the KGB. Really? I suppose they are KGB. Dear boy, you tell me. It's what we pay you for. Unless they're giving it low priority. Though word is Panin's on a plane from Moscow at this very moment, so they must be taking it seriously. Excellent. Then things are going according to plan. Sir, what if David finds the real Pembroke? It must be lying around somewhere. That would be a trifle embarrassing. Then perhaps it might be prudent if we took him a bit more into the picture. If David is to be a convincing lure for Panin, he must believe that we want those boxes found. And that the aircraft in the lake really is the Pembroke. And the corpse, such as it is, really is squadronly disturbed. Yes, I understand all that, sir. But what if he succeeds where everyone else has failed? For God's sake, the Russians have tried. We've tried. Men have died. There's no question of that. But we've convinced Audley. Chances are we've also convinced Panin. I still think it's a risk bringing those two together. But Panin is a man of influence in Moscow. We hear from our friends he's having trouble with the Hawkism element. He's an old adversary of David's. An old and respected adversary. He's just the sort of person he might confide in. Could just work the other way around. Good Lord, no. David's one of us.
all these years. Strange to be here. I mean, this was the aerodrome. Part of my childhood mythology. Never been here before. Is this your technique? Do you think perhaps I know the secret of my father's crash? Of course not. <laughs> so, Dr. Audley. Or is it Colonel? Just Doctor. What do you do? Uh, apart from being a spy? All sorts of useless things. Oh, bravissimo. What do you play? Wagner. It's a terrible thing. How fascinated we Jews are by that man. I suppose it's obvious why. Then why keep a bird in the cage? Where else could he go? Can you see little Herman here? Fighting with pigeons and thug like London sparrows for a crust on the embankment? <laughs> How close do you believe we are to another war? Another big one? Closer than anyone will ever admit. Why? Well. Berlin. What was in those boxes? It was all so long ago. Something which Hitler ordered to be burnt along with the rest of Gestapo records. Steerforth nicked them, believing they contained Nazi loot, art treasures, I don't know. But he crashed, and four people have been murdered. Why? By 1946, a handful of Russian and Nazi intelligence officers had of necessity become aware of the contents of the boxes stolen from the Forschung Zamt by Flight Lieutenant Steerforth. The Soviets were so concerned to keep the contents forever secret that they organized the murder of everyone concerned in the affair. The operation was run by Igor Panin. But one intelligence officer survived. I take it I'm talking to him. I am the only man alive, doctor, outside the Soviet machine who knows what was in those boxes. No one else, not even the Israelis. Will you tell me? Why not? That was the main runway. According to the station log, your father developed engine trouble as he cleared the Belgian coast. By the time he was over the Humber, he was on one engine, which he reported as rough. So he made the others jump? No, he then got down safely. He landed? It was all in the fire. But then he took off again. Overshot? It's not clear on that point. But the chaps who wrote the log were sticklers for accuracy. If it says landed, taxied, took off, that's exactly what it means. He circled, presumably intending to land again. Then quite suddenly the remaining engine packed up. He managed to get the others out safely, but by then it was too low for him to jump. As we now know, he ended up in a lake about 60 miles from here. But why would he want to... Right, you two. 
This is loaded, and I'm happy to use it. Can I help you? Utopia. I am looking for Utopia. Ah, yes. Sorry to give you a start. But there have been some right queer folk hanging about these parts. What kind of people? Uh, a couple of foreign-looking blokes. Is this one of the men? Could be. That's the man that was hanging around David's house a couple of days ago. He said he wanted to buy his car. Ministry of Defense, you say? Well, I'm still not selling. What? These blokes. They said they heard the old airfield was up for sale. Well, it's not. I've got an application for planning permission in. Chalet dwellings and a swimming pool. A couple of good summers and I can kiss the pigs and sheep goodbye. You could always turn it into an open prison. Take a closer look. Please, Mr. Warren. And I do assure you the Ministry is not interested in acquiring this airfield. Then what were you doing here? Just after the war, somebody lost something. Now everybody and his brother is trying to find it. This is a bloke. Well, they did most of the speaking. Foreign chap. I caught him searching this old control tower. Dead and night. Skuriev. Piotr Drevich. Look, please phone me at the Bull Hotel if you see him hanging about. And don't try to speak to him. This is... Important, is it? Fairly important, yes. I hope you and uh, Mr. Smith have a right enjoyable stay, miss. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, sir. You'll be Mr. Smith then. I. Uh... Thompson. Thompson. Room 26. Single. Right bloody room place. This is done. Hey. Do you think he'll like this? I... Hugh, what exactly does David do at the Ministry of Defence? He's just a civil servant, really. Like you. Pretty boring, really. I've seen quite a bit of Friesla. Fund of knowledge, old Theo. Yeah, nice fella. Jake, what do you think's in those boxes? Surely Friesler told you. He told me the Tsar's crown jewels. I can't help you. Why play games? David, someone is playing a game with you. You want some advice? If it's free. Go for Panin. My people think he wants to talk to you. To me? That's what they think. You're such a tease. Soll sein mit Glick. I have it on excellent authority that they discussed Operation Lucretia in great detail. The name Panine was bandied around, and confidential sources of the intelligence service were mentioned. It really is a most serious breach. Yes, I see. Well, thank you for bringing this to our attention, Mr. Llewellyn. This is not to be taken lightly. Dr. Audley has acted in complete disobedience to an order to keep clear of the Mossad with whom he became a mite too pally while he worked on my desk. The point is noted, sir. I shall be making a formal request to your DG to have Audley booted out of the service. I take it you are joking. Sir, I really can't permit you to rifle Audley's desk. Yes, I've done you the courtesy of warning you of my intentions. So that your own report and advice can sit comfortably alongside that for my own desk at FCO. Oh. I trust, Commander, that you get the message. Oh, yes, sir. Loud and clear.
large scotch, right, sir? I've just lost 50p. You only need two tens. You get three goes for 50. Tell the barmaid. Still there? Sometimes. OK, fill me in. I got hold of the old Air Ministry and Security Service files. One of the blokes murdered in Berlin the first time round. Was the DG's brother, Bill Russell, Field Security. Check. The second point of considerable interest is the actual crash. Contrary to what we, well, I certainly assumed, the plane landed on one engine, got to the end of the runway, going maybe a mite too fast, and, and took off again. How did you know that? Because I'm beginning to understand how that rather likable pirate, Squadron Leader Steerforth J, actually operated. Где тот англичанин, где Он не здесь, товарищ парень. Will you be cross if I ask you something? What's that, young lady? You're not still furthering your inquiries, are you? Of course. I mean here, in this room. Well, you don't think I do this sort of thing? For fun, do you? <laughs> look here. Very, very special things, I mean. This is very creepy, that's good, isn't it? Professor Panning, what a very great pleasure. How do you do? Jack Forsyth, Royal Archaeological Society. I'm uh, helping out with this cultural visit. Of course you are, Commander. And I'm Tsar Nikolai II. Shall we dispense with this comedy? Right. I'm here to tell you that Dr. David Audley, Ministry of Defense official, has been assigned to liaise with you. Cup of tea. <sighs> Dr. David Audley. One of your best brains. Please take me to him. Oh, well, he's out of town right now. I'm not 100% sure just where exactly he is. Room 19, the Bull Hotel, Newton Chester. We shall continue with this archaeological business for the benefit of all but yourself and the doctor. Yes, of course. Do you mind telling me what's actually in these magic boxes of yours? Merely trinkets, part of the Tsar's treasure, of some value to my government. It must be, Professor, considering five people have died over it. Quite. And if we don't reach Dr. Audley very soon, the death toll might be incalculable. The lower part of the aircraft fuselage would have been out of sight as a control tower. Uh, this building here, we're at Barricade, so that would have been in a way. Good, I think we're getting there. Uh, tell me, you lived here during the war, as a boy. Your father farmed here. How do you know that? I noticed a sort of, uh, sort of earthworks or something here. What was that, gun emplacement? Down the far end? Hmm, mm, let me see. Well, it was Akak guns, of course, but they were on concrete platforms with sandbags. Nothing much down there but the diggings. Diggings? No, oh, local archaeology club had a dig going there before the war. With my father's permission. He was a JP, civic-minded. But that stopped when they built the airfield. Oh, no. Most RAF station commanders encouraged it. Quite a few of the Brill Cream boys joined in, actually. A break from all that flying and admin, and singing, we'll meet again, and roll me over round the piano. Mr. Warren, 
You're a genius. There's one about a foreign legion officer and a camel. Very new. I mean, the foreign legion officer, very new. <laughs> Just in time. Professor, Dr. Audley. Hello. How do you do? Now, my friend, you ran the Middle East analysis team until this Pembroke reappeared, and I was the KGB advisor to our Middle East ambassadors. One never tires of remarking on the smallness of the world. And because of this, I get to trust you. Oh, yes. And because of this, I hope, this esteem might be mutual. Without a doubt. In 1946, a certain British pilot, transport command, John Adam Steerfor. A bit of a rogue. A bit of a rogue. He relieved the Forschungs and 4 v 9 Department of the Gestapo Berlin Command of a number of boxes. Almost immediately, NKVD, the grandfather of KGB, started looking for those boxes. I gather they looked rather hard. Yes. During the course of this investigation, uh, you caused a number of people to be killed, tortured in some cases. You're exaggerating, David. We don't use torture. Anyway, I failed. And now, even though I'm at the top of my tree, this business with the Pembroke still intrigues me. <laughs> it will be wonderful to return to Moscow with our lost treasure. I'm not sure we're not on a fool's errand. No, why is that? I don't think the aircraft is genuine. Do I then? Who knows? Perhaps somebody just wanted to rake this whole thing up. Why? I am a mere appendage of the machine, Professor. Anyway, the joke is the aircraft was unimportant, real or decoy. Because I think I've tracked down these elusive. What did you say was in them? Treasure. Neglected. And confused. What do you mean? Well, you're not sure if I brought you here for your own safety or just for a good time. Civil servants comforts. Well. Hmm? Which is it? I think I've gone and fallen in love with you. I know. I feel the same. Morning, Professor. Hello, Faith. You mustn't be angry, Doctor. When I saw Miss Steerforth looking so alone in the hotel dining room, I brought her along. It seems a pity to keep two people emotionally involved apart. 
Fine. I've obtained a plan of some archaeological diggings that went on here until after the war. They finished uh, just about here. Somewhere where something could be dropped from an aircraft without being observed. If they were quick. If they were very quick. And this is what happened with the Pembroke. Well, that's what we're about to find out. Well, I'm glad that my archaeological cover has not been entirely wasted. Comrade Guriev. Da. Let's see some of your contribution to peaceful coexistence. Got something, boss? Good man. My government's instructions are to allow you to witness this find. The boxes will then be taken unopened to London and held at a secure place in the Department of the Environment until a formal request can be made by the Soviet government. Then the boxes will be opened in the joint presence of the Soviet and UK officials and itemized. In the event the Soviet ownership is proved or obvious, the contents will be returned forthwith. Well, that's all proper and according to protocol. Should the boxes turn out to contain the Tsar's treasure, my government would be most grateful if they would be exhibited at the British Museum prior to shipping back to the USSR. One day I will play chess with you. Yes. Well, let's just see how this game turns out, shall we? Sir, we found something. Let's get the boxes in the car and back to London. I'm afraid not. The boxes will be put into my car and driven to the Soviet embassy. You're a barbarian. I thought that was common knowledge. But you won't get a mile, man. May I remind you, Doctor, that this car is a Soviet embassy car. And Mr. Guriev here, as a third secretary, enjoys full diplomatic protection. The repercussions, for God's sake. Ah. I've had a brainstorm. My country will be desolate. The boxes will be returned. And I will be sent for psychiatric treatment. Ah, oh, yes. You're very good at that. Guriev! Ah. Mashina! Bye! Bustro! Если вы хотите, это ваша жизнь. You, break open the locks. What will we find in there? You will find files, documents. You will burn them with gasoline from the sky. You will burn them and destroy the ashes. And then? And then you are free to make a diplomatic protest. It would seem, Igor, the boot is on the other foot. He's 
all yours, David. Well, Igor, it would seem I have you in check. Go to hell. Guriev is no longer your comrade. Comrade? What is he? GRU? Well, I'll tell you what we propose to do. We'll send Guriev back to your embassy about three hours before we release you, which should give him just enough time to discredit your good self and therefore your supporters in the KGB and the Kremlin. What do you want? Why don't you tell me what's in the boxes? Highly secret communications between the Nazi High Command and Red Army Chiefs of Staff to overthrow Stalin and Politburo, and to work with Hitler for a Nazi, Russian, Japanese axis, which would, of course, have meant the defeat of the West. And been the death of the Soviet Union, a betrayal of everything your country has suffered since the revolution. Precisely. Is it all there? Positive. And how will this help you control the Red Army? Simple blackmail. Right. Nick, you hold Guria for 24 hours. Hugh? Sir? Get into your chums at MOD and arrange for the professor and the boxes to be flown to Moscow this afternoon. I'll make sure he and the boxes reach RAF North Holt safely. You're a brave man, Doctor. How will you explain to your employers that a senior British official rendered such services to the KGB? Hmm? Oh, I'm always in trouble.